Okay, I'd like as if we could to turn to 1 Corinthians, very familiar portion of scripture, chapter 13. And I want to read several readings, and I'm pretty sure by the time I'm done reading, you'll guess what the theme for tonight is. But 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in, in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And then please turn with me to 2 Corinthians. I'm just going to do several readings to begin with this evening. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And it, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And then please Romans, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And then please, Galatians. And this will be the last series of readings in Galatians chapter 5. But I just want us to, again, just let all of these scriptures soak into our minds before we uh, consider the topic this evening. Verse 5. Uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5, sorry, verse 6, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Verse 13 and 14, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and then verse 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love i'm just going to stop right there well i guess you've probably guessed what the topic is this evening and uh, uh, Ramon is guessing Robert Chapman. <laughs> That's interesting that he would say that. He is one of the people that I'm going to speak about tonight. I'm actually going to go on a church history binge tonight. I'm going to mention five different individuals, uh, three principal individuals that I want to speak about, and then two lesser known ones that influence the third person I'm going to speak about. But I want to make a definite connection here this evening. And it's a very simple thing, and that is this. There is a definite connection between love and revival. And I want to kind of make that connection very clearly. And we're going to try and demonstrate that from both scripture and from history in the few minutes that we have together. Now, of course, there always appears to be an exception to the rule. And as I was talking to uh, my dear wife, Anne-Marie, about love and revival, she said, well, you know, the greatest revival in the Old Testament was preached by a man who wasn't very loving. <laughs> uh, wives are really good, aren't they? At kind of showing us th things like that. And of course, she was talking about Jonah. And of course, Jonah was hardly the most loving preacher. But nevertheless, I still think that it's an, a, a wonderful example of the love of God. Even though he would use a loveless preacher, uh, it demonstrates the love of God for a people who were known for their cruelty and their wickedness that God would go to such lengths to get this errant preacher to go and present a message to them 
is a great demonstration of God's love for a lost world, isn't it? So, so even jo Joan is going to fit in uh, to this topic. But uh, the church history people, I want to mention three, as I said, three well-known individuals that all of us would know. And I'm going to give you them, John Wesley, Robert Cleaver Chapman, and D.L. Moody. Three well-known men that we know about. And then we're going to talk about two people that influenced D.L. Moody in his thinking towards love. And so, first of all, we want to think about John Wesley. And, and I'm going to kind of give you the outline to begin with. Uh, his emphasis was on perfect love. And it was an emphasis on love and holiness of life. Okay, so we want to think about love and holiness of life. Robert Chapman, often called the Apostle of Love, his emphasis was love and caring for the flock. And we want to think about that. Love and holiness of life, love and caring for the flock. And of course, D.L. Moody, we know very well, uh, his emphasis uh, was on love and evangelism, caring for the lost, uh, lost and dying world. So those uh, three individuals uh, certainly I believe, will uh, shape our thinking a little bit about love. So I want to start with John Wesley and this emphasis on love and holiness of life. He, wrote, he gave a sermon, and it was called The Scripture Way of Salvation. It was perhaps his best-known sermon. And he talks about a controversial topic, entire sanctification. And in, in talking about this, I'm not saying I endorse what he's saying, but I, I want to just follow his logic for a little bit, because I think there's, there's tremendous truth in what he's saying, even if I can't go the whole way. And so yeah, he defines entire sanctification in this way, a full salvation from all our sins, from pride, self-will, anger, unbelief, or as the apostle expresses it, let us go on to perfection in Hebrews 6 verse 1. But what is perfection? The word has various senses. Here, he says, it means perfect love. It is love excluding sin, love filling the heart, taking up the whole capacity of the soul. It is love rejoicing evermore, praying without ceasing in everything, giving thanks. Now, Wesley, he describes Christian perfection or entire sanctification as perfect love. Sin is ex excluded from perfect love. The two, he says, cannot exist together. Sanctification is entire in that the love of God fills the heart and takes up the whole capacity of the soul. Perfect love leads to constant rejoicing, prayer, and thanksgiving. And so his, his whole idea is this, that if God's love could fill our hearts, there wouldn't be any room for anything else. I like that idea. I, I think whether I can go ahead and say, well, um, that's happened to me. No, I, I wouldn't say that. Would I like that to happen to me? Absolutely. Wouldn't you love to be so filled with love that there was no room for selfishness and pride and, and all these other sins? And that's, that was his aspiration. And um, whatever you think of Wesley and his doctrine, it largely was based on the thoughts that we shared in Galatians chapter 5. And particularly this idea of love is the filling of the law, is the fulfilling of the law. Let me just read that scripture again in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14 for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and and i suppose it's true if our hearts are filled with love um we're not going to covet what somebody else has we'll just rejoice that they have it uh, we're not going to deceive them or lie to them because we love them why would we do that you see and so the idea is this that that love uh, really does as it were uh, deal with all the commandments and of course even even the first four they're all to do with loving god aren't they and if our hearts are filled with love for him and then for our fellow man then there's no room for sin and so he would suggest this that we need to have more love and i would i would go 100 go along with this uh, even personally and say this i need more love in my heart and i think that would make a tremendous difference in my life and service and so we know that we need to have more love in our lives love for christ love for souls love for scripture love for the house of god 
Why? Because love never fails. Isn't that wonderful? It never fails. <laughs> Other things will definitely fail, but love never fails. Sadly, Often in many of us, self-love dominates us and dominates God's people. Oh, that we had more love and it would produce more holiness. It really would. If I really love Christ, I would not want to do anything that would ever sully his, his reputation, that would ever cause anybody to say, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want anything to do. If I really was filled with love for Christ, it would really affect my holiness of life. If I really cared about my fellow human beings and was filled with love for them, uh, it would change my conduct towards them. And so we, he would suggest and would be at least an example to us of this idea of love, revival, and holiness. And we move on to Robert Cleaver Chapman, this uh, apostle of love, uh, love and caring for God's flock. And of course, that's not a strange idea, is it? Do you remember when the Lord recommissioned Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? <laughs> feed my lambs, feed my flock, care for, care for what I love. This is the man who we know about received mail addressed simply to the apostle of love, England. <laughs> now, that's just tremendous, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine uh, like getting a mail like that in the in the post office? Like, who who is this addressed to? And yet somehow they knew that this was speaking of Robert Cleaver Chapman, and it was delivered to his address. That's a remarkable thing. Such was his his reputation for love. Now, here's a, a, a quote from Biblical Eldership Resources website. Um, which is a very helpful website, by the way, uh, and it's just called biblicaleldership.com, I believe. But it says this, in our day, we are in desperate need of examples of godly, loving, humble church leaders. We are hungry for role models who will challenge us to live and love like the Lord Jesus. Robert Cleaver Chapman was one of those leaders. And you can't help reading his biography without being challenged to love more, <laughs> to love God's people more, to care for God's people more. And if you've never read his biography, it, it is online. It's, it's free. You can read it, and it is well worth reading. It's a wonderful biography. But here are a couple of his choice sayings, because he also wrote one book. One book survived, and it was called The Choice Sayings of Robert Cleaver Chapman. And he says this, God is love. 1 John 4, 16, his children please him only so far as they are like him and walk in love. Now, isn't that very challenging? God is love, 1 John 4, 16, his children please him only so far as they are like him and walk in love, Ephesians 5, verse 2. He said, if we would so love all saints as to please God, we must bear in mind that their names are written in heaven and on Christ's heart. Otherwise, we shall love some because they're lovely and dislike others because of their blemishes. That's very challenging, isn't it? We should love them because their names are written in heaven and on Christ's heart. Can't be based on whether they're lovely or not because some saints are not easy to love right? There's always sandpaper saints. Every assembly has them. They always rub you up the wrong way. Uh, maybe where, where some of them, I don't know, but you, you know what I'm saying. These people can be very difficult, but there's Chapman. And of course, uh, much that could be said about him, but one of the things that love is patient, and he was very patient in dealing with saints, in dealing with circumstances. I mean, he just really modeled Christian love in the assembly there in Barnstable and had a great reviving effect in a sense because of his work. The gospel not only was in Barnstable, but it spread out throughout all of North Devon. And there were many assemblies established, many souls saved. And certainly this loving individual was a key player in all of that. And then we want to talk just briefly about D.L. Moody. Um, and the two men that that influenced him, one was Harry Morehouse. We all know about Harry Morehouse, I think, in that story. But the second one was a man called Henry Drummond. And I'm going to talk about him in a little while. But the emphasis was love and preaching the gospel. We've seen love and holiness, 
loving and caring for the flock of God, and now love and preaching the gospel. The well-known story of Henry Morehouse and his preaching at Moody Church and the influence it has on Moody's preaching. And so here's a little excerpt. Uh, Moody had been away. He had allowed him to preach, uh, but he just figured that uh, he just looked like a kid and there wouldn't be much result from it. But it says, here's the extract. When Moody returned, his wife, he asked his wife, well, what about that young preacher? Oh, he's a better preacher than you are. <laughs> Imagine your wife saying that. Why, said Moody. He is telling sinners that God loves them. He is wrong. God doesn't love sinners, said Moody. Well, go and hear him, replied his wife. Why, is he still preaching? asked Mr. Moody. Yes, he's been preaching all week, and he's taken only one text. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten sin, son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As Moody listened, he discovered Morehouse was still on the same text and that souls were being wonderfully saved. Moody confided to a friend, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to thaw out I could not keep back the tears. I just drank it in. So did the crowded congregation. I tell you, there's one thing that draws above everything else in the world, and that is love. One thing that draws above everything else in the world, and that is love. Mr. Moody was present at the meeting when Mr. Moorhouse got up and said, I've been hunting and hunting all through the Bible looking for a text. And I think we'll just talk about John 3.16 once more. <laughs> Mr. Moody testified that it was on that night that he got his first clear understanding of the gospel and the love of God. Think what, what that meant for Moody's life and in the lives of tens of thousands who were reached through his ministry to know that God loves sinners. Moody's evangelistic preaching was to take on a different tenor that would have a profound effect and impact. Also, this last person I'm going to mention was a man called Henry Drummond. Now, if you read about him, Warren Wiersbe has an interesting uh, biography about him in his books of uh, Christians You Should Know. And, and the man, we would consider him to be a liberal in many ways. He didn't believe in, in creation. He was an evolutionist. He was, a, he was a strange individual. But God greatly used him. It's amazing. I just always am shocked how God uses people that I don't agree with. I mean, I just find that remarkable. But he constantly does it, which amazes me. Uh, but certainly, I wouldn't. Uh, we probably wouldn't want to have much fellowship with Henry Drummond. But... Uh, he was at a, a meeting where Henry Drummond gave an address called The Greatest Thing in the World. And it was in 1884. This is a little copy of that booklet, The Greatest Thing in the World by Henry Drummond. And uh, it, he was so impressed. He asked Drummond to come to Northfield in Massachusetts, where he had his conference grounds, and give the same address. And then, second time he heard it, he was even more impressed with it. He had it published and read before the students of his school every single year. He felt it was so important. And it is, a, I just read it this afternoon because I've had it on my bookshelf for a long time, but I finally got down to reading it. And it is a remarkable ex, uh, exposition of 1 Corinthians 13 about the superiority of love. And it's very challenging. And really the principal thing is love. And certainly, this had a great impact on Moody and his students. Moody said this, the one great need in our Christian life is love, more love to God and to each other. So as we pray tonight, perhaps we need to acknowledge, if we're honest, our lack of love to both God and to our fellow man. Maybe we should ask the Lord, because remember we read in Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost who was given to us. Maybe we need to ask the Lord to fill our hearts with his holy love as we yield our, ourselves afresh to him. 
God fill us with love and pray for loving holy saints that Wesley envisioned, that we'd be so caught up with love for Christ and our fellow man that there won't be time to be bothered with sin. Pray for loving shepherds, a new generation like Robert Cleaver Chapman, who would really be caring for the flock. And then pray for the Lord to raise up loving evangelists like D.L. Moody, who will tell another generation that God loves sinners. And surely, one of the things that, that Drummond brings out in this pamphlet is that one of the principal reasons that people end their lives by their own hands is because they feel like nobody loves them. How tragic for somebody to go into eternity without knowing that somebody loves them when God loves them so much. So revival and love, oh God, help us <laughs> to know something of your love in our hearts. Forgive us for our lovelessness. Amen.